It's a privilege and a pleasure to be here. It was a defining moment during the early part of my PhD work when I got hand of the modes of communication of cholera. And, and the, the copy of that book was, had a personal dedication from Jon Snow with the kind regards of the author. It was the first publication. Holding that in my hand, I almost heard music, you know. And I read it, you know, nothing else. I read it all the way through. And I really learned epidemiology from it because it's such a nice piece of those now disregarded as low quality ecological research which is so valuable in a poor society when you explore so and then also analytical epidemiology and it fitted very much what what I've done I've used extensively the graphs from from uh, that publication in my teaching and when in London I always brought my my students to the pub here I even had the, 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 the there's little there was a little uh, budget from that, which I had for the best student in the course, you know, <laughs> I got 20 of them. So it's very nice to be here. I'm going to start to talk about the research which I did, not 10 years, it was 20 years actually. And I will start to give credit to all the persons I work together with, especially Julie Cliff, yeah, which is a student of this institute. She was my teacher in epidemiology crush course uh, in the survey directly in Mozambique. Because what happened was I went to, to work in Sweden. I, I graduated as a medical doctor. I did my internship up in northern Sweden. And uh, that was a county here with 360,000 inhabitants, 800 MDs, and 30 kids died every year. We had six big hospitals. It faced the Baltic Sea. I came to Mozambique as an immigrant doctor. Just recruited, no aid organization. I got salary directly working for the public health service in Mozambique. And I was assigned a district, Nakala district, 300,000 people, two MDs at best. Eight months I was alone. I never forget those eight months. And 3,000 kids died every year. And I had to put those maps on top of each other and realize the range of access to health service in the world. This is the first, first transparency I made when I came home after those years and started to teach, and it still works, you know. That you had about the same amount of people, you had about the same area, it was facing Indian Ocean and the Baltic Sea in the same way, just that there were two MDs here and there were 800 there, there were 3,000 kids who died there and 30 there. So my life has been about zeros. <laughs> And thanks goes to India, who invented this fantastic number, huh? which is so difficult to understand. I've come to the conclusion that basically we only understand one order of magnitude, <coughs> because we have ten fingers. And we can, we can understand one-tenth of the resources, but we don't understand one-hundredth of the resources, one percent. I went to work in Mozambique in the morning, and I had to think, in Sweden now, 100 MDs is going to do what I'm going to do. How do I choose? Do I do it faster and do I speak very fast with the patients? So I can... <laughs> <laughs> or do I, do I have to select what I do? On the other hand, there were 3,000 children dying here and only 30. So the difference in resource need was 10,000 fold. It was absolutely mind boggling to try to compare these two. And this is by no way example of developed or developing countries or Western countries developing world. It is the extreme of the two. It's the extreme of the world. Most of the world population live with resources in between these two. But, but this is more or less, less where we was. And, and in this area, on the 19th of August, 1981, I got a little, little note from the nurse who had worked 21 years in that health post. And she said she had got 30 women and children with paralysis of the legs. She had never seen anything like it come. Mama Lucia, or Sister Lucia. And great credit goes to her also for, for my work. We drove there with the car, and what we saw was this. <coughs> this was in Kaba, and the photo is taken by Sander Essers from the Netherlands. She had clothes for the kids, and they have varying degree of spastic paralysis, and it was an epidemic curve. that had started two weeks ago, and there were more and more every day who came. So I was faced there. I remember it very, very clearly. <coughs> 21st of August, 1981, 8 o'clock sharp in the morning, I became researcher. Before that, I didn't like research. <laughs> I thought it was a waste of time. 
Because I regarded the world that we needed to apply the knowledge we had rather than try to increase it. And I was punished for that hybrid. Uh, so I had to become a, a researcher. That's how I look at it. You know? And I had to answer the question, was this infection, hysteria, deficiency, or toxins? The four major causes of an epidemic outbreak like this. And it was really a very, very privileged situation to become researcher in, although it was scary. What do you think was most scary in this situation? And I tried to sleep that evening, having examined those patients. What was it that filled your mind completely? It was the scare of being infected yourself. It almost blocked you from working and thinking. And the idea of how can I run away? What could I do? What, what is this? I will get it myself. I will be crippled. We had had a South African submarine who was in the area trying to recruit people and start that terrible civil war that Mozambique suffered so much for just some weeks before this happened. So one alternative was that this is military warfare and this is a, a, a virus which they let loose. It was realistic. It was not such a paranoid hypothesis. And, and, and uh, this is what we found. We managed to do a survey of 200,000 people in four weeks without funds. Uh, Frelimo took the first 10 motorbikes that passed the uh, city and gave it to us. Uh, and and the, the drivers were very upset, but they were allowed to drive their motorbikes. We gave them oil, which was in shortage. It's very interesting to run in communist planning economy, how you run things, you know. If you have oil, you have power, you know. And, 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 and we managed to survey this one with nurses. And we could find that it was an inland area here, heavily affected by drought that year. But we had about 20 to 30 per 1,000, about 2% affected. Along the coast, nothing. In the inland, nothing. In the city, nothing. And what we found in that area was it was a very special dietary situation, which they have never uh, experienced before. They say, we live on cassava in this area. And cassava, as you may know, is the fifth staple crop of mankind. About 400 million people, 500 million people live on cassava every day. And, and it contains bitter roots with cyanide yielding bitter roots, where it's uh, the main staple crop. And they said, normally we sun dry them for weeks like this, and then the toxin goes away until we make it into porridge and eat it. But this year, we had to make porridge earlier without getting all toxin away. They were still bitter tasting, and we had nothing to eat together with it because we lost all other crops. So it was a monotonous situation. One started to think about beriberi and pelagra rather than about virus, gradually over this year. Especially since the disease didn't transmit into the city, didn't go into the inland, it stayed in this area where people had this diet. And, and we managed to do studies and see that they indeed had the highest dietary cyanide exposure that was measured ever. And at the same time, they had very low intake of sulfur amino acids, and that became early, early on hypothesis. Uh, and, and we managed to develop develop the analytical method for this. And we could show a seasonality. Julie Cliff followed this up with, with patients came. There were small outbreaks the following years, and that was when the dietary situation peaked, and they had this toxic exposure. I ran this through relatively, relatively fast. We then found out that there were outbreaks in other areas. This was noted in northern Tanzania. It was investigated by William Howlett, an Irish neurologist. And that was extremely important because he brought the best of clinical neurology into this disease and described it. And, and, and then we could publish it as a new clinical entity in brain. It was accepted in 1999. It was a disease of destitution. Even these patients, I have the formal permission of the families to show these photos. And I think that's very important that you have that in all these situations. They couldn't read or write, so I don't have a written one, but we have it with witnesses that we can use them. And they wanted it to be shown. This was Tanzania, and there the government acted. And, and, and it, it went away uh, this period when they only had the toxic cassava to eat. We found it also in, in Zaire. Congo. In fact, it was described already in the 1930s. Yuli Cliff retrieved a colonial report that was not scientifically published. It was in an archive in Brussels. It was described in 1936. So the, the credit of having identified the disease was actually goes to Gustavo Trolli, an Italian medical doctor working at that time. And we did consider whether we should call it Trolli's disease. 
but we decided to go for Konzo, because Konzo was the name given by the first affected population in their own language, meaning, meaning tied legs. So this boy, he had Konzo exactly the same clinical disorder, uh, very, very distinct. The upper motor neuron got get killed during seconds to minutes, and they never function, never come back. It's very similar to Lathyrism. Lathyrism sativa, another P, which can cause a similar nutritional toxicological disease. And, and they had a diet dominated by roots from bitter toxic cassava, and they had high thiocyanide levels, cyanide detoxification product, they had low sulfate in their urine. We could see the same nutritional biomarkers and the same dietary results now in Mozambique, in Tanzania, and here. And, and um, when we looked at the annual distribution of the cases, it was very strange, it didn't exist here. And they came up like this, and then there was another wave here, and it continued every day, but only during the dry season. And we said, what happened here? Because there was no drought in this year. <coughs> a fantastic experience, we went up to a German missionary stage, and there was a 72-year-old monk, he has worked there all his life, and every day he has taken notice on the rainfall. And after those 60 years of rain or 50 years of rainfall uh, registration, the researchers came up and wanted to use them, and tears were pouring down his face. <laughs> <laughs> and the brothers were very bad when I had my hernia operation. They didn't measure during these years. <laughs> you can all grasp the psychiatric diagnosis here, but it was a nice man, you know. <laughs> and, 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 and from his data, from the local area, we could saw that this was not climate related. It was not. It was related to the construction of the new road there, when cassava suddenly became the staple food in this part of, of the country. And when people started to sell all the well-processed cassava and eat the badly themselves in fight for trying to get their kids into school, paying school fees. And this brought me from clinical epidemiology through chemistry, food science, into the economics of rural areas, you know, and the poverty. And the, this. This man is the one who buy cassava. This woman decided not to sell. She now has to walk 12 kilometers to find another place to sell it. Because every, every one who comes to buy cassava has a monopoly, which he has agreed with a politician. <coughs> so it's quite interesting how we came into the agricultural economics of, of this. And we had to, to, to prove this better. These are two of my PhD students, Torkel Tillisher and Bania Mayambo, now professor in Kinshasa. I'm exceptionally proud of him teaching in Kinshasa, and Torkel also teaching in Bergen, in international health. And we decided we had to do something more in ecological studies. We tried in the most affected area in, in Congo to get children the day they got crippled. We talked in the churches, we talked in market, we had a four-wheel drive, and we came to the homes of people. We gave an antidote directly, which didn't have any effect and then we collected blood samples. It was accepted there. And we managed to publish in the Lancet a case control study, a case reference study with three cases. As I know, it's the smallest case reference study ever published in the Lancet. <laughs> but if you have a big effect, you don't need so many cases. People used to brag, I had 3,000 cases, you know. And then you found a very small thing, I said. You <laughs> needed all those cases. You know. <laughs> How many cases you need to see whether, whether, whether penicillin is good for gonorrhea? It's enough with five cases. You know? And parametric test. They had very high blood cyanide levels, those three cases. But they had the same thiocyanide, the detoxification product, they had the same. But they have very exceptionally high blood cyanide levels. So we could not prove, but we could give a high probability that there is a toxiconutritional uh, mechanism back on this. The mechanism we know nothing about, nothing about. And that didn't become my interest, because I got interested in what this poverty was. When I came home to the universities in Sweden, having, having worked so much in the poorest rural part of the poorest countries in Africa, and I heard the talk about developing countries, that's what I got annoyed. I really got annoyed. Because these remote parts of, of northern Mozambique and southern Congo was put together with Thailand, Malaysia, and, in, uh, and Argentina when the world was discussed. And was not irritated from an ideological point of view. It was just that the intellectual level was down here somewhere. 